Meet Horridus, the Triceratops at the Melbourne Museum. Hazel Richards is a curatorial assistant at the museum and was a leading member of the team that put together this exhibit, which opened to the public in March 2022. Horridus is the absolutely amazing specimen that is on display permanently in our gallery at the Melbourne Museum. It is a late Cretaceous dinosaur. You're probably familiar with Triceratops Horridus, uh, one of the most well-known and iconic dinosaurs in popular culture. And the specimen itself is the most complete specimen of Triceratops on display. So it's a, it's a pretty significant uh specimen of Triceratops and it's a pretty significant dinosaur in its own right. Yeah. How how big is it? What are we talking about dimensions? So nose to tail, it's about 6.9 metres long and from bottom of the toes to the top of the frill, it's just under three metres high. So it's, uh, it's pretty big. Horridus is the main attraction in this exhibit, but Richards explains that it's important to set the scene when showcasing an animal that lived 67 million years ago. So I've been to the Melbourne Museum. I've seen Horridus a couple of times now and intend to go many times again. I notice the first thing you see when you go into the exhibit is not Horridus. Triceratops is a North American dinosaur. So our first job in creating the exhibit was placing the visitor in the time and the place of where Triceratops lived. So the fossil was recovered from uh, Montana in North America, uh, which is somewhere you find rocks from the late Cretaceous that all belong to a group known as the Hell Creek Formation. And this preserves an amazing slice of time uh, right at the very end of the, the time of the dinosaurs in the, the late Mesozoic. And um, in the exhibition, we wanted to recreate the environment that Triceratops would have inhabited. So when you walk into that uh, initial part of the exhibition, you're immersed in this very lush, uh, very um, diverse and very dynamic environment where you can see critters that are uh, what you might expect, other, other dinosaurs, iconic species um, like Edmontosaurus and uh, Ornithomimus and other late Cretaceous dinos, but also things you might not expect to see like, like crocodiles and fish and even small mammals. So we know from the other fossils that are found in the same rocks as Triceratops that all of these different organisms all inhabited this woodland, swampy, forest kind of environment. But how do paleontologists go from a few scattered rocks to building a picture of an entire ecosystem? We were able to construct this, this immersive simulated environment where Triceratops might have lived uh, because there are so many amazing fossils that are found uh, in those rocks of the same age. So tri uh, our Triceratops specimen, Horridus, is a absolutely spectacular complete articulated dinosaur fossil but really we can glean a lot of scientific information from things that might not be quite so spectacular to look at but when you look at them in aggregate all together they give us a slice of all of the things that inhabited that environment so tiny fragments of teeth you know little broken bits of bone if they can be diagnosed down to you know what what family of dinosaurs or even what species of dinosaur or other critter turtles fish crocodiles salamanders all of these guys um, it helps us to to build the world. It's not just about the, the huge charismatic dinosaurs with amazingly complete fossils. And this is, of course, complemented by other things like fossilised leaves, fossilised pollen. Um, and when taken all together, we see we're in an environment that is, is very wet. There are a lot of freshwater um, fish and, and reptiles and amphibians uh, that, that tell us that this is sort of a swampy, um, very humid, very um, bayou kind, kind of environment is the best I can think of. Um, so, yeah, maybe maybe not what you would be expecting to see Triceratops in, but, but really good evidence for what that environment was like. Yeah, and presumably, I mean, that would be the reason why we have such a, an exquisite fossil in the first place is because of the environment and the way that it was fossilised. That's right. So the reason that Triceratops, the, this, the reason that this Triceratops was so well preserved is because it died in a watery environment. Because in order for a fossil to to survive this huge intervening amount of time, it has to be covered very very quickly with uh, a very fine sediment. And this is what we see in the in the surrounding fine grained sandstone that the Triceratops was was uh, prepared from. It tells us that it was uh, probably in a freshwater 
environment, something like a slow moving river channel. And either the dinosaur died in the water or near the water and was washed quickly into the water and then very rapidly covered over with these fine grained sediments. Uh, this is because nothing had scavenged the carcass. So clearly nothing could get to it to nibble on it uh, before it had started to decompose. Um, and the fact that the, the body cavity itself is actually was in, when it was dug up, it was preserved in 3D. So all the ribs were more or less in position. Um, the, the kind of the guts of the animal was all very much in 3D, which tells us that that body cavity must have been infilled with sediment before all of the vertebrae and the, and the ribs fell apart as their ligaments and soft tissues decomposed. So there's a few things that we can reconstruct about um, the circumstances of its death and its burial uh, just on the basis of the, the, the presentation of the fossil that we can see 67 million years later. Horridus's fossilised remains weigh about a ton. The process of getting the bones out of the ground and into a museum exhibit was made even more difficult by the COVID-19 pandemic. Richards explains that each fossil fragment was painstakingly 3D scanned in Canada and its relative position recorded. And so my role was as a curatorial research assistant. So um, functionally it meant I was doing a lot of the research underpinning the stuff that you see in the exhibition, um, but also uh, in particular working with the 3D data. So as these scans were coming through um, overnight for us, because obviously with the time difference in Canada, I would wake up and see what new bit we'd got of our triceratops, a finger bone, a rib, a tailbone, um, and gradually piece it together in 3D on my computer. And so it was a virtual 3D puzzle with these, with these little scans of, of our big dinosaur on the other side of the world. And yeah, over the course of that year, uh, bit by bit, getting the dinosaur together. And as it was coming up out of the rock, there were aspects to the fossil that we hadn't anticipated. So um, it's beautifully preserved. Everything is more or less in articulation. But over the course of those 67 million years and all the geological processes that went on, uh, the fossil itself has become really interestingly distorted. So um, the pressure and the heat created by the overburden um, and the tectonic forces and things like that um, have caused what we call like a plastic deformation. So the fossil itself hasn't shattered or broken, but sort of squished, if you can imagine something that is as hard as a rock squishing. Um, and what this uh, functionally means for us is that uh, there are some really interesting asymmetries in the fossil. This is most obvious um, if you're able to look at the skull from the front, you can see that the face is kind of slipped and slumped to one side. And this is reflecting the fact that the dinosaur came to rest on its right hand side and kind of has a bit of case of geological pillow face or it's a bit mushed. Um, and most challengingly for deciding how the, the fossil itself was going to be presented in the gallery was the fact that the left and right legs are quite significantly different in length. Um, when you look at it from behind in the gallery, you can really see that the right femur, the thigh bone, um, is about 20% shorter than the left one. And this is because that right leg, uh, as that animal laid down and died, was preserved upright. So it experienced those forces on its ends and its left leg was horizontal, which meant that it experienced forces sort of across its length. Um, and so one was kind of squished a little bit longer and one was squished to be a little bit shorter. And so uh, what that meant for our dinosaur is that we have something that has, uh, is lopsided. Um, and so one of the very early decisions uh, that we were able to make constructing that dinosaur in 3D was, um, trying to compensate for this, um, what we would call like an artifact, this, this asymmetry that wouldn't have been there when the animal was alive. Um, and so you'll see that the, the Triceratops has a lifted uh, rear right leg um, to, to bring that short leg up off the ground to try and disguise the fact that it's so much shorter than the, than the left one. So some design decisions were made to preserve the scientific integrity of how the fossils were found buried in the ground. Most dinosaur displays in museums are actually molds with the real fossils stored away in very controlled environments to protect them. Not so with Horridus. This is one of the very few places, the only place in Australia and very few places in the world where you can go and see a complete articulated dinosaur skeleton that is the real specimen. So because we were able to document 
the specimen so well. Every little piece of that dinosaur is scanned in 3D, is photographed in multiple views, is measured, is documented in, in incredible detail um, because it's going to be on display permanently. So people can come to Melbourne, can come to our gallery and see this real dinosaur. Um, and our scientists can instead study the, the 3D models. They can study the data that was gathered uh, before it went up on display. It's all very cool, but what does Richards think is the value of having a display such as Horridus available to the public? What makes this dinosaur special is just how complete it is. And so that's what we wanted to present to the public, the authenticity, the real thing, so that you can experience this object that is this nearly impossible thing to have been created, like the, the chain of events that had to take place in exactly the right way for this thing to be preserved, let alone found, let alone put in a public museum for everyone to enjoy, is just astounding. 